now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. We go back to June 7th, 1959, for what we believe is the only radio show that was ever a spin-off of a TV show. Have Gun, Will Travel. A lot of people say, why don't you do more westerns? Why don't you do more westerns? Well, here you go. Have Gun, Will Travel. Uh, this episode, as I said, June 7th, 1959, and this episode is uh, entitled... Roped. You can stay in this cabin and fight it out, or face the men who are waiting to lynch you. Either way, it's a poor choice. Gun Will Travel Starring Mr. John Daner as Paladin San Francisco 1875 The Carlton Hotel Headquarters of the man called Paladin Good morning, Miss Wong. Oh, Mr. Chang. Good morning. Yes. Uh, oh, please, Miss Wong, uh, at the Carlton Hotel, you speak to me as, hey, boy, everyone does. Oh, yes. I forget. Good morning, hey, boy. Uh, good morning. Oh, um, you did not meet Mr. Paladin before he left. No. The lady in charge was showing me what the new duties would be each morning. He left very early. Oh, yes, but uh, in a few days, he returned. Then I introduce you to my very good friend. Oh, that would be very great pleasure. Oh, oh yes. Uh, oh, no, 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 no. Something is wrong? Oh, when you make Mr. Paladin's bed, you make it uh, West Point style. West Point? I don't know what you mean, West Point. Oh, I'll show you. Oh, hey, Mr. Paladin, very particular about bed made army way. Mr. Paladin in the army? Oh, no, 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 but he was several years ago. Oh, yes. yes he said it is only proper way to make bed. Ah, so. Uh, you do not tuck your blanket on the corner like this. Oh, no. no. You watch careful now. All right. First you fold on the bottom side like this. Yes. Then you hold up the end of blanket and tuck on the corner like this. Oh, yes. Yes, now. Drop blanket and tuck on a whole side. Oh, corner's very smooth this way, Mr. Chang. Yes, uh, 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 hey, boy. Ah, yes, hey, boy. May I please try other side? Okay. Mr. Paradon teaches you to make bed like this? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I learned many things from Mr. Paladin. Oh, <laughs> what I work at Carlton Hotel... Perhaps you teach me many things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it would be a great pleasure. This is Frank Knight speaking for Longine, the world's most honored watch. It's wonderful to win a Nobel Prize in science, a Pulitzer Award in literature, an Olympic gold medal in sports. In the field of time, did you know that Longines watches have won more great public honors for excellence, elegance, and accuracy than any other watch in the world? This is true. For close to a century, the highest authorities have ranked Longines watches as the finest achievement in the science and art of watchmaking. Yet, for a surprisingly modest cost, 
you may own or proudly give a Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, styled with distinction, cased in precious metal, promising a lifetime of faultless timekeeping. See your authorized Longines Whitnor jeweler. He will be honored to serve you. The job was finished. The man who had hired me in Salinas had given me an extra hundred dollars to prove that he was pleased, and I was on my way back to San Francisco. It was good to be alone on horseback. As I rode through the verdant coastal valley, I was reminded of Illinois, as I had known it when I was younger. In my imagination, I could see myself riding along on my father's farm, everything very green and sparkling, wonderfully new. Hours became minutes. Then suddenly, I realized it was almost sundown, and I was lost. I had apparently taken the wrong turn at a fork a few miles back. My plans had been to stay overnight in Morgan Hill with an old friend, but now I'd have to bed down on the trail after I found water. While I was looking for a stream, I saw some smoke circling over the treetops a couple of hundred yards ahead. A closer look revealed a small cabin nestled in a grove of eucalyptus. Hey, oh, easy, boy. Don't come no closer. Hey. This is private property. Well, hold your fire. I'm not trespassing. This is my land. Strangers ain't welcome. How come you're nosing around here? I was looking for a creek. My horse needs water. People don't look for creeks in these parts. Everybody around here as friendly as you? Just be on your way, mister. Look, I've been riding all day. If you look at my horse, you can tell he needs water. You got a well, I'd be willing to pay. How much? You tell me it's your water. You willing to pay two dollars? That's your price. Let me see the money. Here. All right. You can have the water. Dismount and walk your horse up to that trough by the pump. I'll be right behind you with this right. All right. Walk. You're mighty free with that rifle. There's been a lot of horse stealing lately. You got a lot of horses? You out back, they're good ones. They're worth stealing. I don't take any chances. I see. A man don't just happen to wander onto my land. This ain't on the road to no place. I wouldn't be here if I hadn't got lost. I was on my way to Morgan Hill. You're better than ten miles from Morgan Hill. Not much water in the trough. There's more when it's gone. I'm afraid I won't have any luck picking up that trail before morning. It's going to be a dark night. Dirt? What is it, Agnes? Supper's on the table. I'll be in in a minute. What's he doing here? He's watering his horse. Dirk, I heard the shooting. What was it? Nothing. Who's that man with you? Stranger. Is he staying for supper? No. I'll need more water. Well, you just pump it yourself. Dirk, why did you hit him? I don't trust him. You killed him. He ain't dead. He ain't moving. Why'd you do it? I aim to find out who he is. Like he's breathing. He's breathing. There ought to be something in this wallet telling who he is. Here. Huh? You read the printing on this card. I see. It says, Have gun, will travel, wire Paladin, San Francisco. His name is Paladin. And that card means he's a hired gun. You don't think... I might have known come snooping around here near dark saying he's lost. You think the ranchers hired him? Yeah. Probably old Fred Mosley. I got more of his horses than any others. 
Don't pay, really, does it? What do you mean? Always run and hide and pretend and it oh. don't mount to a thing. We could make a better living digging clams on the beach. Horse thieving don't amount to a thing, Dirk. Now, don't start that again. You just get us ready to move out of here by sunup. What are you going to do with him? I don't know. I never killed a man before. This just might be the first time. And yes, thank you. We're including a few of the original commercials in this episode of Have Gun, Will Travel. June 7th, 1959, here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. You ever make a change and then think, why didn't I do this years ago? Well, that's how people feel about switching to MediShare for their health care, especially now with inflation the way it is. People are very happy with the savings. Most families save about $500 a month when they switch. It's a huge help when prices are going up so fast in so many other areas. And MediShare's customer satisfaction rate is double that of health insurance. It's just a different experience, and people really like that. MediShare is an alternative to health insurance. It's a community of Christians who share each other's health care bills, and it's been going strong for over 25 years. It really is the gold standard, the most trusted name in health care sharing. Find out why people love it. Find out why they rave about the customer service and find out how good it feels to save some money right now. They're super easy to talk to. Here's the number, 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE. 833-34-BIBLE. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, more of Have Gun, Will Travel, starring John Daner, June 7th, 1959. Somebody had exploded a stick of dynamite inside my head. I tried to reach up and stop the throbbing, but my hands wouldn't move. They were tied behind my back. I tried to move my legs, but I only felt the rope that was binding them together. Finally, when I was able to focus my eyes, I found I was lying on a bed in the corner of the cabin. In the middle of the room, there was a table with a dim lamp on it, and a woman, Agnes, was bending over a box, stuffing it with pots and pans. She must have heard me move because she looked up. Oh, finally woke up, huh? Uh, why, why did he hit me? You can be thankful he didn't kill you. Why would he want to kill me? We're on to you, mister. Dirk thought you looked suspicious and he was right. He found your card. We know you was hired by the ranchers to come after Dirk. I don't know what you're talking about. I suppose you deny your name's Paladin. No. That's my name. Well, don't be tricking me. You can be honest with me, because I saved your life. Dirk wanted to kill you, but I talked him out of it. You can thank me for that. I'm grateful. I do thank you. That ain't your skin I'm worried about. I'm just not going to have my husband start killing why would the ranchers hire me to get Dirk? There you go again. Now listen. I don't know who your husband is or what he's done. I was lost. The smoke from your cabin led me here. I wasn't hired by any ranchers. I don't know anybody this side of Morgan Hill. Now believe me. I'm telling you the truth. If you are, we wouldn't have to move on. I'm telling you the truth. We could stay here. Dirk? Dirk? Yeah? Come in here. Do you believe me? Maybe I do. I wasn't lying. I'd like to believe you. Maybe because I'm tired of running. Maybe because I like this valley, this cabin. Seems like a home. I told you to keep the door closed. Now, what do you want? He woke up. Is that why you called me in here? I was talking to him. I think you ought to hear what he's got to say. We don't have time to prate with bounty hunters. I got the wagon hitched up. Are you done with the packing? He says he wasn't hired by the ranchers. 
Has he been giving you some soft talk? You always was a sucker for soft talk. I wasn't soft-talking your wife. The ranchers didn't hire me. If he's telling the truth, we don't have to run. I'm not taking any chance. Dirk! Now, Salai, get down on the floor. Can you see anything? No. No, it's pitch dark out there. Come on out, Dirk. We know it's you that's been stealing our horses. Come on out. That's Fred Mosley. Come and get me, Mosley. There's the answer to your soft-talking friend, Agnes. Listen to me. She was beginning to believe you. I was right. You was hired by the Mosley gang. I don't know Mosley. I didn't know you were a horse thief. You ain't even a good liar. Look, if you'll untie me, I'll prove to you I'm not with those men. I'll help you out of here and see to it you get a fair trial. Otherwise, they'll hang you. Dirk, maybe what he's saying... He's tricking us again. Don't listen to him, Agnes. He led those men here. I should have killed you in the first place. And I'd shoot you now, but I got a better plan. Mosley! Yeah? I got your man tied up in here. What man? The man you hired to come after me. We didn't hire any man. He says he was hired by you. His name's Paladin. I'm gonna shoot him if you don't leave me be. It won't work. You're wasting your breath trying to fool us, Dirk. If you don't come out, we'll burn you out. Do you believe me now, Dirk? Maybe he was telling the truth. It don't matter now whether I believe you or not. They're going to burn the cabin. Paladin, what would you do if we untied you? Help to see that your husband doesn't get lynched. Now, how can you do that? Well, there's at least three men out there, and they're not going to settle for anything less than a lynching. No matter what you or anybody else says to them. Besides, what do you care if I hang or not? I believe in a fair trial. A man's guilty, it should be decided in a courtroom. Trial or no trial, I'm going to hang. At least you wouldn't hang tonight. You'll have a chance to hire a good lawyer. Are you coming out, Dirk? Or do you want to stay in there and fry? Paladin, how do you figure on getting me this fair trial you're talking about? Give yourself up. Now, they'll take you nearby. I can follow you and surprise them before they get the rope around your neck. Agnes can go with me with a shotgun. With us undercover in the dark, the odds will be just about even. All right. All right, maybe it'll work. But there's just one thing you didn't mention. What's that? Agnes will stay behind you all the way with that shotgun. And she'll shoot you if you don't do what you just now said. Fair enough. All right, Agnes. Untie him. Fred Mosley didn't believe there was another man in the cabin. I hid behind the door, but they didn't bother to come inside. They were only interested in Dirk. Agnes stood outside until they were gone. And a few minutes later, we were on horseback, following the sound of Mosley and his men. Paladin? Yeah? I'm scared. For yourself or Dirk? For Dirk. Don't think about it. Ain't no cause for me to hold this shotgun on you, is there? No, no, there isn't. Uh, I can feel it. You're different from most. You're clean. There ain't no pretending with you. I know that for sure now. Hold up. I get down. We'll walk from here. (laughs) Now follow me and be as quiet as you can. There they are. Quiet now. Come on. Hang, 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 hang,
All right. Let's stop here. A man brought him by my place. He already got the rope tied on his neck. Yeah. Oh, swing the rope over there. They're ready to slap the horse out from under him. Hurry, Paladin. Uh, stay behind this rock. Keep the shotgun trained on Mosley, but don't shoot unless you have to. I'm going to move up closer. Get ready to slap him when I. Mosley! Who's that? I got four men with me, armed with shotguns. We say you're not going to hang Dirk. Come on out here where I can see you. Not likely. Why do you want to stop a hanging? He's a horse thief. Clear out, Mosley, before we start shooting. How do I know there's four of you? Try us. You don't leave me much choice, mister. We can't fight men we can't see. All right, Tom. You and Bill get on your horses. Mosley, don't try anything. John Daner, I thought, did a real good job on Have Gun, Will Travel. In many ways, radio suited a lot of these shows better, but... Everybody wanted television. Everyone wanted something to fit that 24-inch screen. There you go. Uh, We'll have the conclusion of Have Gun, Will, Travel, and Roped, June 7th, 1959. And yours truly, Johnny Dollar, coming up next right here. Stay tuned. Radio. Why should I advertise on radio? There's nothing to look at, no pictures. Listen, you can do things on radio you couldn't possibly do on TV. That'll be the day. All right, watch this. Okay, people, and now when I give you the cue, I want the 700-foot mountain of whipped cream to roll into Lake Michigan, which has been drained and filled with hot chocolate. Then the Royal Canadian Air Force will fly overhead, towing a 10-ton maraschino cherry, which will be dropped into the whipped cream to the cheering of 25,000 extras. All right, cue the mountain. cheering extras. Now, you want to try that on television? Well... You see, radio is a very special medium because it stretches the imagination. Doesn't television stretch the imagination? Up to 27 inches, yes. She was born in a humble shack amidst the lemon groves of Goleta, California. Mommy, don't cry. You know what they say? When life gives you lemons, make lemonade. I was going to say life sucks. And then you die. But I like yours better. And with that, Alexandra Johnson launched her lemonade stand. Lemonade, nickel a glass. Every day, even during the frigid California winters, a bone-chilling 72 degrees, you could find her. You can have a sour, you can have a treat. Little girl's lemonade will knock you off your feet. The little girl with the sour brew wanted more. National distribution franchises. And so she rolled out a well-budgeted advertising campaign. Me and the rest of the dock workers only drink little girl lemonade. She was made president of the International Sour Drink Association and chosen to give the keynote speech at their convention. You all sat with words of wisdom. Them, honey? You know what they say, Mommy. Always advertise so consumers think of your product first. I was going to say never swallow a lemon seed or a watermelon on your tummy. This fabricated but interesting story is to remind you that it's called advertising and it works. Put your message on this national advertising platform by emailing classicradiotheater at gmail.com. Classicradiotheater at gmail.com. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of Have Gun, Will Travel, and Roped. This episode from June 7th, 1959. We're leaving. No, wait, Mosley, don't do it. Oh, no. Agnes, stay back there. Dirk. Dirk. Paladin. Can you hear me? You cut him down in time, didn't you? He's all right. He ain't moving, but I know he's all right. Ain't he? He's dead. We didn't stop him, did we? 
slap that horse out from under Dirk right before our very eyes. I'm sorry, Agnes. You tried. That's all you could do. You want to cry, Agnes? Go ahead. Uh, It'd help. I don't want to cry. I know it was going to happen one way or another. That's why I was scared. But it's all over now. I'm not scared anymore. How would you like to help solve a mystery? This is a medical mystery, the mystery of MS, multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is a chronic crippling disease of the central nervous system. It can affect various parts of the body and usually puts its victims in wheelchairs. Those victims, thousands of them, are hit mainly in young adulthood, in the age group between 20 and 40. Nearly all of them, when they're told they have multiple sclerosis, say they've never dreamed it could happen to them. As a matter of fact, it can happen to anybody. That's one of the few things we know about MS. Much of the rest is a mystery. But you can help solve that mystery. Its solution will come through painstaking, costly, medical, and scientific research. The money for this research must come from the MS Hope Chest. Help fill that Hope Chest now. Give new hope to thousands of sufferers from MS by giving to your nearest chapter of the Multiple Sclerosis Society or sending your contribution to MS in care of your local postmaster. And Sam Rolfe is produced and directed by Norman McDonnell and stars John Daner as Paladin with Ben Wright as Hayboy. Tonight's story was written by Frank Michael. Featured in the cast were Vic Perrin, Gene Bates, Joseph Kearns, and Virginia Gregg. This is Hugh Douglas speaking. Join us again next week for Have Gun, Will Travel. From June 7, 1959, Have Gun, Will Travel on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar with Bob Bailey and, uh, oh yeah, Howard McNear. That comes up in just a few moments here on your favorite radio station. Are you suffering with arthritis or osteoporosis? Do you have diabetes? Did you know that these are just two of the hundreds of diseases that have seen improvement with Dr. Wallach's incredible longevity products? You can't get them at a health food store. The only way to get them is to call us at 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Do you have heart disease, fibromyalgia, or high blood pressure? Do you have a terrible time losing weight? Dr. Wallach can help. He was a veterinarian and cured diseases in animals. He felt that he could do the same for humans, so he became a physician. Over 50 years of research and helping people like you goes into every bottle of Dr. Wallach's amazing discoveries. Do you want to feel better? Learn how to treat the cause of your problem rather than covering up the symptoms with drugs. Call 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. So some of you might be wondering why I referenced Howard McNear as being a part of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Well, in this episode, he's playing a semi-starring role uh, is as Mike in the indestructible Mike Matter. And this is uh, part four of the five-part story. This episode of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, originally broadcast June 7th, 1956. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this phone number you left for me to call, are you at Bellevue Hospital? Yeah, Randy. What's wrong? Are you at headquarters? Yeah. A truck ran over Mike Flynn, and I'm sure it was deliberate. But he's alive, I hope. 
He was four hours ago when I dragged him in here. Indestructible Mike. I'm not so sure this time. What about that truck? Did you get the license? Yeah, the boys at the first precinct are working on it. Check with them, will you, while I stay here at the hospital? Sure, Johnny. And one other thing. Yeah? Find out how long that Glad Hand rescue mission has been in existence. The place where old Mike's been living? Yeah. Why? I don't know, yet. But do it, will you? Sure, and you let me know when Mike's out of danger, huh? Johnny? Better pray a little bit, Randy. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location New York, New York, to the Lakeside Life and Casualty Company. Following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the indestructible Mike matter. The veneer of class and education assumed by J. Wesley Cosgrave just wasn't thick enough to hide the fact that he was better known a few years ago as Dutchie Gordon. And to the old-time racketeer, it looked like a cinch. Pick up a Bowery bomb like Mike Flynn. Insure his life for 50 grand. Give him a few weeks of high living. Then knock him off and collect the insurance. Yeah, real cinch. Especially for Cosgrave, who'd learned as far back as the early days of Prohibition how to employ hired thugs to do the dirty work while he sat back and collected the profits. I knew as surely as I'm sitting here that Cosgrave was behind the knifing, the shooting, and now this accident to old Mike. But how to prove it? Yeah, sitting here in the waiting room of the hospital, waiting... Waiting for some word of Mike's condition. Mr. Dollar? Oh, yes, Doc. Can I see him now? Very shortly, I believe. Oh, well, how is he? Is he There's having... a phone call for you at the floor desk. Oh. This way, please. Thanks. But how is Mike? Doc, how is uh, he? You'll be able to see him shortly. Here you are. Oh, thanks. Johnny Dollar. Ah, oh, Mr. Dollar, I was quite sure that you would be there at the hospital. This is J. Wesley Cosgrave. What made you think that? Why, because of the accident to Michael Jeremiah Flynn. How did you know about it? I kept it out of the papers. I find it helpful to know about a lot of things that don't get into the papers. Well, your boy goofed, Cosgrave. Mike is still alive. My boy? You know as well as I do, Dutchie, that one of your mob was at the wheel of that truck that ran him down. You better keep your yap shut, Dollar, or I... I, uh... I thought I made it plain to you earlier that I no longer have any connection with the doings of the, uh, shall we say, underworld. Oh, sure, sure. As for poor old Mike, I understand it was an accident, a very unfortunate... Knock it off, Cosgrave. I was there when it happened. Oh? Yeah. Pretty stupid of a would-be killer to try that with an investigator right next to Mike, wasn't it? Did you see the driver of the truck? Suppose I did. You say he wasn't one of your boys, so what difference would it make to you? Why, none. None at all. Did you see him? Why don't you worry about that for a while? Again, I waited. Sat and waited. And paced the corridor of the hospital. Outside, the sun sank slowly behind the horizon of skyscrapers, and the busy clamor of the day's traffic segued to the softer, muffled, but still busy traffic hum of night. And I waited. And smoked. And waited. Finally, it must have been close to midnight... The nurse led me quietly down the hall and indicated the private room that I'd had set aside for Mike. After brief instruction about not staying too long, she pushed open the door for me and she tiptoed away. And there, lo and behold, in all his glory, his head swathed in bandages but wearing a smile a mile wide, sat indestructible Mike. Hi there, Johnny. Mike! <laughs> oh, Mike. You old reprobate. Uh... I guess there is something in prayer after all. Uh, how about this, Johnny? Isn't this swell? Isn't this the finest place you ever saw? Oh, Mike, you're going to be okay, aren't you? Going to? Yeah, I am now. But I guess I had those doctors scared. Oh, my, 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 Johnny. You just should have seen the way they fluttered around. All. And those nurses, Johnny. I never saw such beautiful ladies in all my life. And so nice. And doesn't it smell good in here? The disinfectant they use in here is much nicer than Daddy Bill has at the mission. And you know something? I haven't seen a single bed bug. Not even a cockroach. Oh, Mike. Mike, I'm so glad to see you in one piece. Oh, sure I am. 
But an old bum hasn't any right in a pretty place like this. You had no more business living through that accident than... Oh, Johnny, how you talk. Yeah, yeah, and you mustn't talk so much. No matter how good you feel, you need rest. Time to heal up whatever got broken. Broke? Oh, me? Well, you still need rest and quiet. Here, I'll turn off this light. Uh. <laughs> I'll see you in the morning. Oh, but, uh, Johnny. Yeah? Johnny, how can I just sleep? Oh, too much pain, huh? Want the nurse to give you a hypo? Oh, they fill me up with more needles than you ever saw, but there's only one real painkiller, you know. <laughs> Yeah. I, uh, <clears throat> I'll see you later. If the administration of Bellevue Hospital ever found out that I was back in Mike's room a few minutes later, and why, they'd probably have my neck. But I, I didn't leave the whole bottle with him, I swear it. Only about three fingers in his water tumbler. And the blissful expression on his face as he closed his eyes to sleep made me sure I'd done right. Item 15180, taxi back to my dingy little hotel. And I thanked whatever gods may be that old Mike had pulled through. He'd been right. They just couldn't seem to kill him. So far. But I knew they wouldn't give up. Not with $50,000 at stake. 50000 more to line the pockets of Dutchy Gordon, who I was sure was just as much of a racketeer as ever, despite his present name of J. Wesley Cosgrave and his pretense of gentility. Because his henchmen had always feared to squeal or died violently before they could, the police had nothing on him. My job was to find one of the mob, make him sing. But how? I guess I was still thinking or dreaming about it when my phone rang the next morning. Hello? Jay Dollar. This is Jay Dollar. Hello? Oh. 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 Uh. Johnny Dollar. Hey, you still in bed? Mm -hmm. Oh, Randy. Yeah, I thought you were going to call me. Is he still alive? He sure was when I last saw him at about midnight. Oh, that's a miracle after what that truck did to him. And say, yeah. uh, the boys downtown found that truck. Yeah? Yeah, it had been stolen and was abandoned. Did they find any prints on it? Plenty. Whose? Lefty Skillman. Well, have they picked yeah, him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They found him all right, tied up in a sack floating in the East River. Old-time gangster style. Oh, so help me. I knew that when Cosgrave found out... You say out... Uh, Mike's going to be okay? Randy, he was sitting up in bed perky as a cockatoo. No. I don't know how he does it. Why, he was all ready to pack up and go back to the Glad Hand Rescue Mission. Huh? Felt he didn't deserve to be in such a nice, clean place as the hospital. <laughs> Bless his foolish heart. Did you find out anything for me about that flop house? Yeah, that's what I called you about. Uh, but you still haven't told me... Well, what'd you find? Uh, well, according to the records, the building was put up in uh, 1901. As a mission? As a piano store, 1901 to 1906. A real respectable place. Then? Well, that section began to degenerate. 1906 to 18 was a cheap grocery store. 18 from 1956. From eight, 1918 to 22 was a second-hand clothing store. And a speakeasy till 1929. Keep going, Randy. Well, I guess the Depression knocked that out, because next it was a saloon. How long? Let's see, uh, 1944. That's when William Grover Larkin took over the lease. Daddy Bell. Yeah, that's I right. I knew it, Randy, I knew it. Yeah, what? Dutchy Gordon, alias J. Wesley Cosgrave, told me that he'd got a hand from that mission when he was just a kid. Hmm? That would have meant 25, 30 years ago, at least. Yeah, it's only been a mission for 12, but... Hey, wait a minute. The lease on that property, when it was a speakeasy, it was in the name of Larkin, too. Add one more fact, Randolph, and you see what I'm getting at. What's that? Your own police files show Cosgrave was still in the rackets in 44. Yeah, but on a charge that we couldn't substantiate. Right. Tie him up. Cosgrave was a rum runner during Prohibition. Daddy Bill ran the speak for him since 1944. Whoa, 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 now, boy. You're trying to build a case on purely circumstantial evidence. All right, but I think I can make it stick. Now, listen. Where does Cosgrave get the thugs for whatever job he's pulling now? If he is. Of course he is. And he gets them out of that flop house. The boys he gives jobs to that are never seen again, remember? Yeah, wow. Hey, maybe it does tie up. Oh, you bet your sweet life it does. At least I'm going to tie it up. No, no, no. Take it easy, Johnny. Just how are you going to go about it? Well, the first thing I'm going to... Well, hold it. Huh? Well, what's the matter? Somebody outside the door of this room, I think. Hold on, Randy. Yeah, no, no. no. Wait, wait, wait a minute, Johnny. All right, what do you think you're doing? Oh, Johnny, hello, hello. Whoever hit me with whatever he hit me with wasn't fooling me. In the second before I passed out, I vaguely remember hearing a voice, the voice of the room clerk, shouting at whoever it was, and the sound of footsteps running away. Then blackness, and a dark, 
heavy throbbing in my head. Then after a long time, another familiar voice. It was Randy, I think. Dimly, somewhere along the line, I could see figures bending over me, hear the voice again. Easy on the stretcher, boy. Then more darkness and the weird sounds in my brain. Other sounds, too, that seemed familiar and seemed meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. Finally, after an eternity of jumbled sounds and shadows, a cold, bright light pierced into my slowly returning consciousness. And momentarily, I could see a man in white, and women in... Yeah, yeah, a hospital. These were the doctor and the nurses. I tried to speak to them. I couldn't. But slowly, a realization of what had happened came to my muddled mind. Randy on the telephone had heard the attack on me and had brought help. An ambulance had brought me here. For a brief moment, I saw the glint of a needle poised above my arm blackness again, but a soft, quiet, peaceful blackness. Johnny. Johnny. Hmm. Johnny. Oh, oh. oh wow. Well, what are you... <laughs> Johnny. Oh. That's the boy. Oh. Wake up. Huh? Mike. <laughs> That's right. Isn't it nice they put you in the same room oh. with me? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Mike. Your policeman friend saw to it. Mm. And he told me something, Johnny. And he's right. Mm. You've got to be careful. They're out to get you, too. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow? Well, old Mike may have been indestructible, but I knew by now that I wasn't. So tomorrow the wind-up. It had to be while I was still alive. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. There you have it, part four of the five-part yours truly Johnny Dollar story, The Indestructible Mike Matter, from June 7th, 1956, and of course, it gives me a moment to mention Howard McNair, who is playing Indestructible Mike. He goes all the way back to uh, the 1937 serial Speed Gibson of the International Secret Police. He was, uh, he created the role of Doc Adams in Gunsmoke on the radio, and he did lots of shows, and, and you know, yours truly, Johnny Dollar, he was all over it, but this is probably his biggest role, uh, and uh, he was in the motion picture Escape from Fort Bravo, although it was an uncredited role, and he ended up uh, being a barber, no, not there, on Leave it to Beaver in 1958, he was a barber named Andy who gave Wally his first shave. And, of course, he would become Floyd the Barber in The Andy Griffith Show. Unfortunately, he suffered a, suffered a stroke. And that's why in later years you didn't hardly see him do much in the show. Yep, Howard McNair, a great radio actor and a fine actor. He passed away at the age of 63 in 1969. 
Visit my webpage, classicradio.stream, where you can stream our shows on demand, learn more about classic radio collecting, and contact me there. Classicradio.stream. You can even, you know, buy me a coffee, although it's really a Dr. Pepper. And do us a favor and thank this station. Support their advertisers. It's their kindness and courtesy that allows us to be with you each and every time we're here. And please, please, tell all your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station. <laughs> 